So, is it working? Okay. Hi, my name is David Normal, and I'm a visual artist from California, San Francisco, to be precise. And I'm very pleased to be here. Um, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the million image release or the mechanical curator, I, I definitely wouldn't be here. Um, so it's really exciting that this took place because it enabled me to do a very elaborate art project called the Crossroads of Curiosity. In late November last year, I was planning to do a large installation for the Burning Man, and I wanted to use all 19th century imagery to create the set of, of, of paintings. We, we visualized this for the, for the Burning Man as a, as a set of four murals to, to illustrate the idea of caravansary. So caravansary, this is the 3D visualization, caravansary being a theme for Burning Man and taking the, the idea of the Silk Road and the ancient meeting places of the camel caravans on the Silk Road, uh, we, we want to extend that as a metaphor for the theme of Burning Man so that Burning Man itself, the large art festival in Nevada, uh, would, you know, would be a kind of caravansary. So we visualized the Crossroads of Curiosity to have this kind of, uh, to have these images. This is one of the images. And I created all the images from uh, 19th century illustrations. And so when I heard of, in mid-December, the million image release, I was really thrilled and I found everything that I needed there and much more. So as you can see, this is one of my collages. I call it conflamingulation. It's kind of a play on conflagration and confabulation. Uh, we've got, you know, a, a Maxime machine gun over here, a Gatling gun over here, and uh, Moai Easter Island heads, and all of these things sort of being mitigated by the influence of a flamingo. And so that becomes conflamingulation. Well, you can see how I, how I did this. First I made, you know, the digital collage with the images that I downloaded from the British Library, from the Flickr's collection. And then I, I printed it out in much larger size and repainted it. So I painted all of this in, in acrylic paint, and that's me in the background working on yet another one in the series. So for the slideshow to start with, I, I've just focused on conflamingulation so you can kind of see its development and, <coughs> and deployment. Uh, this is how we, this is after it had been just installed at, in, at Burning Man. And uh, you can see it's pretty close to what was visualized in, in the 3D visualization. This is it at about twilight. And it's a light box. It's a double-sided light box. It's 8 feet by 20 feet. Those are its dimensions. And I actually gave what I call docent tours, where I brought people around and explained to them the imagery and also its origins from the British Library. And, uh, you know, I would take them through all four of the, four of the images and oftentimes didn't, didn't tell them that I was the artist, so hence it was the docent tour. They just thought I was some know-it-all that could tell them what <laughs> these things meant. <laughs> and uh, so... This gives you an idea of the scale of the installation. That's the towering Burning Man, still under construction in this image, uh, at 100, 100 feet tall. These four tents were what were known as the souk, and there were, there were four images placed centrally in each one of these tents, and they were centerpieces for what was kind of a Burning Man international convention right, right in the middle of the festival. Uh, this is after just preparing for the man to burn. You can see the wood piled up to uh, set the thing ablaze. And you can also see w how my images were placed. There, there's uh, Ostriskazocracy, and that's Percogeturesque. I think there's a hint of another painting back there, and off, off would be this. So they were at the ordinal points of the compass around the feet of, of the burning man inside the tents. And this gives you an idea of just how big and heavy each one of these things was like about 1,000 pounds. So we had to build them on a 40-foot trailer and pull them out of the playa using a crane and then put them back on. And they've gotten hauled back, and uh, they're in storage now. But uh, the plan is 
Um, fingers crossed, we're going to bring them here to the British Library this summer and place them in the poet circle of the piazza. And this would be, uh, this is a 3D visualization of, of about what it would look like. And this would be an exhibit here at the British Library uh, opening up on the summer solstice of this upcoming year. So one of the things that people ask me about the most in reference to these collages and in reference to my work in general is how do I come up with the ideas? I mean, because, you know, where do I, I, I get the connections between things? And in order to address that, I have what I call a, a, my own aesthetic philosophy that I call crazyology. So there's a lot of different parts of crazyology. But some of it, I feel, is pertinent to pattern recognition in computers. So what I'm going to do is go through specifically the aspects of cognition, of how things are seen in the crazy logical mode, and show how these things can, can be you know, applied to pattern recognition, how some of the same principles work. And I know that some of you may be really interested in getting the coronography and the sleezometry, but that's a different lecture. So you know, <laughs> you'll have to come back another time for that. So OK, the cognition. Um, I have three different elements, icongruity, Blobularism and photophilia, and I feel that you know most most visual art, especially painting, can be broken down into these elements, and that they are just kind of common building blocks of of visual cognition. So we start with icongruity. This is a graphic that comes from a project called Media Streams from MIT Media Lab, and. All these little icons are somehow for use to, to map the broadcast universe. So I don't know exactly how that works, but they're, they're, they're typical icons. We've got a paw print here. It's a very simplified form. We've got, uh, I don't know, a hand holding something, a chess piece, a hurricane, so many different things. And they're all little icons. And what icons do, as you know, is simplify you know, very complicated visual ideas and images into things that we can just easily recognize. So when a child is learning to see the world, I think that children break things down into very simple icons. They're just kind of placeholders for the complex understanding that they obtain as adults. Well, children's art reflects this iconography. So this is a kind of interesting children's drawing in terms of explaining children's art because the, the, I think it's a little girl, has drawn a kind of triple-headed dog princess, a kind of princess cerebrus, if you will. Uh, and, and, and you can see that in each dog head, she always does the same thing. She makes a little pink round nose. She makes big blue eyes. She makes a, a triple, you know, pointed crown. And if she drew a million-headed dog princess, all the dog heads would be the same. And so this is a good example of you know, icongruity, what I call icongruity in art. And another good example that's much more sophisticated would be a Tibetan Tonka painting. So Tibetan Tonka paintings are, are elaborate compositions of icons. I mean, everything about a Tibetan Tonka painting is, is carefully defined, the face, the hands, the folds of the robe, the feet, the t way the toes curl, everything down to the, the, the smallest detail is defined. And Tibetan Tonka painters spend their lives mastering these icons and, and how to compose them. Well, similar to the icongruity that allows us to recognize the face of the Buddha is the icongruity that allows a computer to recognize a human face. So in this case, we've got this set up to recognize a, a beautiful woman's face, a kind of vogue fashion idea of beauty, which is very you know, constrained geometry. Yet these uh, patterns of icongruity and facial recognition uh, are, can also be so mutated that they can recognize beauty in a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> So uh, this, is a, this derives from a project by a fellow named Greg Borenstein uh, from New York University who uh, did something called machine pareidolia. Uh, and this is going to bring us into our next topic, which is blobularism, which is recognizing you know, faces, recognizing icons in things that do, don't actually have any form. But here, you know, where pareidolia is like when the Virgin Mary is seen in a piece of toast or something, uh, or in this case, the, the computer is seeing a face in this key, or it's seeing a face in the back of this truck. 
So, you know, Greg Bernstein, he, he programmed the computer to recognize images in things that weren't human. Uh, so I tried using the same software that he used to, on an image from the mechanical curator. And so I chose a very typical image uh, from, from the collection, which is a dignified, aristocratic man in his, you know, diagonal sash and his collection of medallions. And, uh, you know, so, so that's icongruity, right? So it's finding icon, it's icons. Well, blobularism is about finding those icons in natural forms or in subjective forms. In this case, we're seeing the Virgin Mary in the trunk of a tree. Uh, blobularism has a distinguished history. Leonardo da Vinci talked about uh, seeing forms in cracked plaster and how he could develop whole paintings out of seeing such things. Max Ernst uh, really did paint that way and he would take a, a, a sheet of, of glossy paper and squish all kinds of paint uh, onto the canvas and then peel it back and get all this reticulation, all these little you know drips and blobs that he would then paint out as he uh, envisioned them to create a drama like the Antipope, 1941. So this is, you know, very much a, was very much a popular technique amongst the Surrealists. Salvador Dali uh, approached it in terms of finding images in assemblies of objects, what he called the paranoiac critical method. So in this painting, which is currently up at the Tate Modern, the original is, is to be seen right now, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, see that this hand holding an egg, it mirrors the image of Narcissus looking at his own reflection in the water, the metamorphosis <laughs> of Narcissus. And it also is quite similar to what uh, Giuseppe Archimboldo did in the 16th century. This is his portrait of Rudolf II as the Roman god of transfer transformation, vertumness, and very much like the paranoiac critical method of Dali. So photophilia is the urge to express oneself in photographic terms. And these four you know, building blocks, if you've been to art school and studied drawing, they teach you to, to the, the sphere, the cube, the <laughs> cylinder, the cone. And, and if you can master rendering those in, in, in light, then you can draw a human torso, a human head, what have you. Well, so, so that kind of photorealism has been a driving force in Western art. This is actually an illuminated manuscript from the British Library's collection of St. Cuthbert, in his incorruptible body being disinterred. And this is, you know, in the 11th century. Then three centuries later, Jan van Eyck's ostensible self-portrait as the man in the red turban shows a complete quantum leap in rendering ability. And uh, some think that the use of optical, in optical instruments like a camera lucida or camera obscura, uh, notably David Hockney thinks this, you know, enabled that leap in, in, in visual cognition. So visual cognition, in my opinion, is, is really a nesting of icons within icons within icons, very much like a, a fractal. So that we, we, from the point of time when we're children, we see simple objects, we get all so much more visual information and we nest it so that we can then have these very complex hierarchies of recognition. And the cubists and analytical cubism tried to break down that kind of visual hierarchy and then spread it onto a 2D canvas. Now, I'm not really sure that Picasso wasn't just adding a lot of his own fancy to this, but nonetheless, there is this element of breaking down, you know, a, a, a photographic form into constituent elements. So now let's go back and look at how these, these elements, icongruity, blobularism, photophilia, how they work together to allow me to use a different principle from crazyology, which is what I call animalgamation. An amalgamation is kind of a portrait of the soul that is done by composing, you know, various different elements that don't go together. So, for instance, Hieronymus Bosch is almost making a collage here. He's taken a bird's head and this cauldron and this body being eaten and the birds emerging from behind. And, and you know, he's, he's collaged them together to make a composite that's kind of a portrait of the soul, an anima, the soul an animal, an animal amalgamation. That's kind of the play on words there. 
So let's do, let's do an exercise in, a, in, in an amalgamation. And we're going to pretend that we're not just human, but that we're a mechanical creator, playing on the idea of a mechanical curator and upping the ante to being a, a creator. And so what we're going to do is go through a, a kind of collage process that uses some of the principles I just talked about to create a collage. So this is a typical 19th century image, as I was saying before. And it's uh, Ferdinand I, Emperor of Austria. 1835 to 48, and we can see that his, you know, his uh, chest there, if we were to create what's called a descriptor for, for pattern recognition, then we would create maybe something like this to recognize dignified chests in, you know, in, in 19th century illustrations. Then we could add face recognition and maybe an oval, and then here's another dignified chest. It very much adheres to that same geometry. Well, then other objects, this is for the sake of collage, we want to keep our descriptors loose, um, could fit into that same thing. And this would be a very dignified head for a dignified chest. Or there could be, I don't know who that is, perhaps King Arthur. Uh, and then here's a Roman senator, I think, of a malevolent cast. Uh, and then we're back to Ferdinand I. But let's say we want to add antelopes. So we need, to we need to create a descriptor for antelopes. So let's say those are the kind of the predominant characteristics of antelopes. They have a very triangular thing with their horns and their nose. And uh, we take emperor, you know. So Ferdinand I is kind of a tragic character. Uh, he suffered from epilepsy and hydrocephalus. And he had perhaps, they think, more than 20 seizures per day. And this was due to inbreeding. His father was uh, Francis II, Roman, Holy Roman Emperor, last of them, uh, and married his cousin and gave birth to poor Ferdinand, who, who uh, could never consummate his marriage to, to Maria Annas of Savoy um, in a little, you know, perhaps if he had been a little hornier, would have been better. Perhaps he needed a greater genetic pool, and his father should have mated with a heart of beast. And that would have, you know, allowed him to, I think, be a little more handsome. Uh, but with our, with our antelope descriptor, we might also have made him a greater kudu. Uh, or I think the heart of beast works better. But with the, you know, dignified chest descriptor, we might end up with this watchtower from Xinjiang province at the western end of uh, China um, that is, I think, part of a caravansary or something like that. Uh, or perhaps using the descriptor, it would end up with the 11th century siege on a castle rampart. As you can see, we've got a strong diagonal there. And... Uh, and try it out some different ways. Yeah, get the head this way, and then here's a different head, and there comes uh, there comes Ferdinand coming back through the bulb, and here's a less militaristic chest and a more militaristic chest, and here's some hair. Uh, probably if the hair got involved, it would throw everything off. I mean, big hair. I think this is actually from Daniel Defoe's portrait. He evidently had some serious hair. So. <laughs> Um, principles of crazyology. Well, so we've gone through, you know, how these things go together. I've tried to show you an amalgamation um, using pattern recognition that is icongruous. And let's go more towards something that's globularistic, though. Okay? So now we're going to start. We're going to go back to the image of Vertumnus, who was probably, Rudolf II was probably uh, Ferdinand the first great, 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 great grandfather back in the 16th century. So now we can add some, you know, let's say we've got a vast array of descriptors we've defined, and we want, it, we want to imagine that this composite head, this paranoia critical head, that all the different geometric forms will then call, you know, uh, pattern recognized descriptor forms from the uh, million image release, from the mechanical curator release, and then begin to assemble them. So we've got a lighthouse, and we're going to get a bunch of kind of light images here. We've got a quadruped, a factory, another head. And I'm beginning to just rebuild uh, Vertumnus a little bit with things that I've found in, in the, uh, in the British Library collection. So now I'm darkening it up a little bit here. And as it darkens up, uh, here we go. Well, so, so 
Then I ran it through the, uh, the facial recognition software, and it did <laughs> recognize the face. You'll notice it doesn't say converge down here. It says it had a little problem with this. But nonetheless, it was able to find a face there. Um, however, I, I broke one of my principles in collage making, which is you're going to make a collage, you want to start with elements that you feel you're at least as good at, or it should be inferior or not better than what you're going to do. Like, and if you're going to try to hold yourself up to Archimboldo, it better be good. Because <laughs> Archimboldo, now the, the, the facial recognition software really thought that Archimboldo was a lot better than me, because <laughs> it just clicked on that face. Like, you know, I mean, you can run a lot of human faces through the thing and it won't recognize the face that keenly. The, the, this assemblage of fruits and vegetables is very well constructed. So, anyhow, what I've uh, attempted to do here is to give you an idea of how ideas of, uh, you know, give you an idea of how, how principles of crazyology, my own creative process and kind of observations on, on art and image cognition could be applied to pattern recognition in computers and how we could suppose a, you know, kind of sci-fi uh, character like a mechanical creator could actually be a, a, a machine artist that creates these things. Now, I was going to end it with a, uh, you know, with a clip from the ruling class. It's kind of the last word on image recognition, but I can't get this to play. Yeah. Your Lordship, this is the first of a series of experiments I'm going to conduct with your head. Ask, and thou shalt receive. What does it look like? Is it a dragon? A spider? What does it remind you? Everything it is, whatever shall be, reminds me of me. If, uh, if it didn't remind you of you, what would it remind you of? An ink blot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. And uh, if you if you know if you want to have a look at my work, it's out in the lobby on the kind of board out there, and you can take a look at it. If you'd like to know more about it, I'm happy to answer any questions. If you want to kind of you know get me in. First of all, we thank David. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. We do have a few minutes. If anybody has any questions. Yeah, um, I mean, as you mentioned him, um, Matt Sense, I mean, clearly the work he did for um, The Burning Man, um, whether it holds, well, obviously it does, given an explanation of phraseology, but just to, you know, from what I can recall of the uh, image was of a fainting woman yeah. uh, with the attack of the vapors and, 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 a, and a field gun placed, you know, to the side of her. Yeah. I mean, those kind of juxtapositions are exactly what Max Ernst was, was about in the 20s and 30s using Victorian engravings. And uh, I'm sure you're aware of the um, sequence of the kind of narrative sequence that he uh, worked out over, over quite a period of time with the character called Lock Lock, uh, who, who, who kind of, in a way, <coughs> allows us to, to follow, you know, but because the problem with what you call collage and juxtaposition is that, in a certain sense, because it's confounding your expectations, yeah. um, you, you struggle to, to kind of engage with the narrative. And, and in his case, his solution was to use this character called Lock Lock, yeah. um, who, who, who sort of knits everything together in an equally fantastic way. So, I mean, quite clearly, the, the work you did, I don't know about your work generally, but the work you did for, for The Burning Man, um, engages with, with Max Evans' um, way of, 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 of using images and, and, and using archival resources in a certain way within the surrealist. Yeah, uh, Max Ernst is une semaine de bon. I'm, I don't speak French, so I hope I didn't mutilate that too much. But a, a week of kindness, uh, you know, 
is was a big influence on me when I was younger, and I always shied away from doing uh, Victorian illustration collages like this because to me it seemed like Max Ernst had been there and done that, and it was done. Um, however, uh, when I began to develop some of my technical processes of, of creating the images um, so that I could paint over the things, uh, and, and this had been this had to do with collage work I had done earlier too that didn't use you know Victorian image stuff but other types of images and was painting over the images. I felt like by painting over it, which is something Max Ernst never really did with you know those <laughs> those type of collages, um, I could you know really make it mine, and I felt comfortable to to approach the the Victorian imagery for the, for that reason. Um, I do think that another, I mean, the thing that Ernst did was just incredibly ingenious, you know, and, uh, and part of it was that it was really an early graphic novel, too, the way, you know, the way he put it together. And I think, I, I'm actually due for a review of it. It's been 20 years, really, since I looked at Ernst uh, and Bont in any, any real depth, you know. Um, another question? Hi. I was just curious that when you when you were doing the, those descent tours at, at the Burning Man Festival, what the, what the type of feedback you got, especially that you didn't identify yourself as the artist. Well, part of it was I was doing some of those tours in character as a kind of mad Italian monk, <laughs> who, <laughs> who uh, you know was uh, uh, you know, and I was speaking with this corny accent and. Uh, and in a robe with a large wooden cross, like I was a kind of hair shirt Christian fanatic, uh, kind of follower of Savonarola or something like that. And uh, so, so you know, that really, people didn't know it was me. Uh, a lot of people did figure it out. They would ask, are you the artist? And I'd say, well, yeah, you know. And, and it kind of varied. But what was the reaction generally? Well, some people... What was most flattering was that some people had actually studied the paintings extensively and had their own interpretations, which they would tell me about at great length. And, and I used some of those interpretations, uh, I would add in, you know, what they had told me. Because, you know, uh, partly in making this kind of stuff, I don't really have like a script of what it's about before I make it. Rather, I put it together. And as I'm putting it together, a lot of times ideas will occur to me. But then a lot of things just confound me, just like they confound a lot of people who look at it. Um, and so people's insights into what the images mean are sometimes just as good as my own. I don't have, you know, there's a certain amount of a kind of mediumistic element to making artwork like this where I don't always know what I'm really doing. And so, you know, there's a lot of perplexity. People were perplexed. People liked it, uh, you know, as a, people really liked it. I mean, people were fascinated overall, yeah. So I got a lot of good responses. Licensed it? You mean like license the yeah, images? Well, no, not as of yet because it hasn't, you know, I haven't had anybody approach me and say, uh, can I make t-shirts of this or can we use this for our band or that hasn't happened yet, you know, so, um, um, but that's probably uh, on the horizon somehow, I would, I have a feeling. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in licensing it, I guess you should talk to me. Uh, well, no, <laughs> oh, well, you know, I mean, the next, as I said in the lecture, probably the next step is uh, to show the work here. And, uh, you know, that's the next big landmark for, for, for these images. Yeah. Um, Uh -huh. um, I noticed there's uh, various culture factors in your paintings. Uh -huh. uh, I wonder, do you have like any, um, it's just uh, your uh, arti artist instinct, instinct or is some cultural meaning, you know, connect, connect, connection behind, behind that to you? Well, it partly had to do with the theme of caravansary, mm -hmm. which 
you know, historically the caravanseries were definitely, you know, centers of cross-pollination culturally. I mean, because the camel caravans uh, brought goods and ideas uh, from the west to the east and vice versa. And I mean, for instance, uh, uh, a lot of Christianity spread out to Asia along the Silk Road. Um, so, however, we were trying to update the idea of, of you know, the cultural cross-pollination to be global in effect and also to be not rooted in one historic time or place. So the collages, um, you know, were meant to incorporate a lot of different times, places, cultures, peoples, and have them kind of collide absurdly or satirically. Um, it was something of a motif to add, you know, Middle Eastern figures and stuff because that kind of kept the the you know, the Middle Eastern flavor of the caravansary in place. Um, and it also fit well with my own predilections simply, you know, just because I've, I've always had a wide ranging interests in different cultures and, and so it wasn't hard for me to make those connections and be attracted to those images. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you all so much.